Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the platinum-containing anti-cancer chemotherapy drug cisplatin, which stands for cisdiamine dichloroplatinum. Okay, so we want to now see how this cisplatin drug actually functions to form crosslinks within the DNA structure. Okay, so what's going to happen is cisplatin is capable of binding to uh, certain organic bases. Now, it has its preferred organic bases. The two organic bases it likes to bind to are adenine and guanine, which are the two purine organic bases. So let me show you the structure of adenine and guanine, and then we can try and understand how cisplatin is going to bind to them. And we'll then look at the consequences of that for the DNA. Right, okay, so we'll start with the structure of adenine, because adenine is slightly simpler than guanine, not by a huge amount, it has to be said, but slightly, and we'll take these small mercies. Right, so adenine. Right, so the structure of adenine is a purine ring. So what is meant by a purine ring? Uh, well, let me... Um, a purine ring is two... Uh, aromatic rings linked together. It's a pyrimidine ring linked with an imidazole ring. So let me firstly show you the structure of a pyrimidine ring, okay? And then I'll show you the structure of an imidazole ring, and then finally we'll see the structure of a purine ring. So we'll do over here a pyrimidine ring. We'll draw its skeletal structure because it's simpler. So in skeletal structures, we don't show carbon atoms. So a pyrimidine ring is really just a benzene ring where you have replaced two of the carbons in the benzene ring with nitrogens. Okay, so impure benzene, which is a truly foul chemical that uh, I know quite a lot of chemistry students and they have never used benzene simply because it's so horrible and also because it's not necessary to use it. Uh, you can um, synthesize everything that you need from safer compounds which contain benzene rings but aren't just pure benzene. Uh, so pure benzene is a six carbon ring where you have alternating double and single bonds between the carbons in that six membered ring and then off every single carbon you then have a single hydrogen. Imagine that ring but then you replace two of the carbons with nitrogens in here but you retain the alternating double and single bonds like so. Okay, so this is a pyrimidine ring, basically. Uh, so we draw the nitrogens because uh, they aren't trivial. So you don't, in skeletal structures, you don't draw carbons and you don't draw hydrogens coming off carbons. So we don't draw these four carbons here. They're just implied. They're implicit. And we also don't draw the hydrogens coming off the carbons. So there's implicitly a hydrogen coming off all four of these carbons because they are missing bonds, basically. We can see that they all only have three bonds. For instance, if we take this one, it has one, two, three bonds. It needs four. So we assume that that fourth bond is just understood to be a hydrogen bond. We would, uh, well, not sorry, not a hydrogen bond, a bond to hydrogen. Okay. Um, and we would have to show a hydrogen coming off these nitrogens if it if there was such a hydrogen, but these nitrogens, they already have free bonds, you can see, so they don't need a hydrogen to come off, they're already fully saturated. Okay, so that's a pyrimidine ring. Now what is an imidazole ring? Okay, so an imidazole ring now. Okay, so in an imidazole ring, what happens is uh, you have a five-membered ring, so it's a five-membered ring where three, three of the members are carbons, and now two of the members are nitrogen, so it's a pentagon. Okay, so here are four of the atoms now, and this, this final one is then a carbon. So we've got a carbon here, a carbon here, and a carbon here, and then two nitrogens in the middle there. Now, you then have a double bond there between those two carbons at the base of the pentagon, and then a double bond here. Now, each of these three carbons only has three bonds, so it's assumed then that the final bond is for hydrogen. However, this nitrogen only has two bonds, and it does have a bond to hydrogen, but you're not allowed to just not show that. You have to then show the hydrogen bound to the nitrogen, even in a skeletal structure. Okay, so what's then the structure of a purine ring? This is an imidazole ring. And let me just tell you why it's called an imidazole ring. Okay, so 
when you have a double bond between a carbon atom and a nitrogen atom, that is known as an imide bond. So that's where the imidazole comes from, because we have this imide bond. Also, azo means pertaining to nitrogen. So dazole kind of means diazole. So um, you've got two uh, nitrogens. That's why this name kind of fits. It's sort of like you've got an imide bond and you've got two nitrogens. That's what this is trying to say, basically. Okay, right. Uh, so finally, we'll just go over the structure of a purine ring, which is uh, the imidazole uh, bound to the pyrimidine ring. So this is the purine ring, which is what we're going to find in um, adenine and guanine, which are these purine organic bases. Right, so in um, uh, in purine rings, what you do is you take the pyrimidine ring, so let's copy out the pyrimidine ring, okay, now I'm going to pull a slight trick on you, I'm going to um, change where I've put the alternating double and single bonds, so I'm going to put the double bond there, double bond there, double bond there, now Either you can just think that I've rotated this 180 degrees, and for that reason it's the same molecule. Or, if you know more about aromatic compounds, you'll know that this really is a delocalized ring of electrons, rather than alternating double and single bonds. It's helpful, it's easier to think of it as alternating double and single bonds, but in reality, uh, this structure is slightly more complicated. You have delocalized rings. But this is the same structure as I've just drawn there. Don't worry about that if you don't uh, know what a delocalized electron ring is. Okay, and then we've got the imidazole ring coming off here, okay, with these two nitrogens like here, you've got this double bond from here, and again, this is an aromatic structure, um, but we can think of its structure as being like this, you have that double bond there, and that hydrogen coming off there, so you can see that we've effectively joined the imidazole ring onto the pyrimidine ring to get what's known as the purine ring. Okay, and we are going to put these purine rings into adenine and guanine, and pretty much adenine is not going to be that far off this. In fact, it's not far off at all. All we do is we add a one group onto that purine ring. So adenine is not a massive alter alteration at all. So let's copy out this structure. And in fact, I think I'll stick to just drawing the skeletal structures rather than drawing the full molecular formulae simply because this gets the message across, and they're more elegant, they're easier on the eye than the um, molecular formulae, okay? And skeletal formulae are widely used, so you should get used to using them. So then we have this, so I'm just copying this purine ring out at the moment, okay? Uh, now I've got this alternating double and single bond system here, and then all you do in adenine is you swap the hydrogen that would have been bound to this carbon up here. So remember, this carbon only has three bonds, so it was implicit that it also had a hydrogen bound off it. You take that off, you chop it off, and instead you replace it with an amino group there. That is the adenine organic base. Okay, now, um, if you want to link this adenine organic base to the ribose sugar, what you do is you take this hydrogen off this nitrogen, and it's this nitrogen which binds to that first carbon of the deoxyribose um, sugar here. So this top member here is not a carbon, it's an oxygen. So the first car carbon is this carbon here, which is involved in the formation of the bond to the organic base, and basically this first carbon is just directly linked to this nitrogen here. Another important member of these um, purine organic bases is this nitrogen here, which is also shown here in our adenine structure. Okay, now this is going to be very important when we actually come to discuss uh, the function of cisplatin, how it works. It works through this nitrogen. Uh, but for now, what we'll do is we'll name this nitrogen. This is known as the N7 nitrogen, okay? And it's important to note that it will have a lone pair of electrons sticking out. So remember, nitrogen has five outer shell electrons. 
Now, three of these outer shell electrons are involved in these three covalent bonds here, but the other two are in a lone pair together over there, and this is a centre of negative charge, basically. This lone pair is very attractive to positively charged um, atoms. Okay, and basically what's going to happen is that this is going to form a bond with our platinum here, uh, well, not here, this is transplatin, with our platinum in cisplatin, and uh, is then going to bind to the cisplatin. Okay, so we'll just then discuss the structure of guanine now, and how similar it is to adenine, and then we'll discuss how uh, cisplatin works then. Right, and guanine, it's fair to say, is more important for the function of cisplatin. Uh, cisplatin combines both adenine and guanine, but it prefers guanine to adenine. Okay, so the structure of guanine then, uh, this other organic base, guanine. Right, so again, guanine is a purine ring, but it's slightly more modified than uh, adenine was. So we'll start off with the basic structure, this six-membered ring, where two of the members were nitrogen, like so, and then the other four members were carbons. We then have this imidazole ring down here, and you'll notice that I'm not drawing in the alternating single and double bonds yet, because uh, guanine is going to be slightly more complicated. Okay, I'll put this double bond here, because the imide bond still remains. Uh, this nitrogen will then be involved in binding to the deoxyribose sugar, or if we're talking about pure guanine, then it will just have a hydrogen there. But obviously, usually, guanine is bound to... Um, the uh, deoxyribose, or maybe a ribose sugar. Um, so, usually we won't be talking about pure guanine, but this, instead, this um, hydrogen here will be replaced with the first carbon of our sugar. Right, then you do still have this double bond here and this double bond here, but you don't have this double bond here. Instead, what you've done is you've put a carbonyl group here, and then you've put a hydrogen off the nitrogen. So, just check that that structure makes sense. We've got this carbon here, which has now four bonds, so it won't have any hydrogens off it anymore. This nitrogen has still got three bonds, so that makes sense. Now, this is not the end of the alterations you make in guanine. You also stick an amino group off this carbon here. So, basically, the alterations in guanine are slightly more extreme than those alterations we saw in adenine to the purine ring. Okay, now, this nitrogen here in the guanine molecule, this is still known as the N7 nitrogen, okay? And again, it still has this lone pair of electrons here, so there is a nice lone pair of electrons here. And this is the lone pair of electrons uh, which cisplatin is going to interact with. Okay, so, without further ado, well actually, yes, we will have further ado, we'll have a break. And uh, in the next video, what we'll do is uh, see how cisplatin actually functions.